Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you with us on our post-election day coverage. Our conversation right now is going to be with Janet Redman, who is the Greenpeace USA's Climate and Energy Director, and we're going to cover some of the referendums and more in our conversation with her. And Janet, welcome. Good to have you with us here at the Real News. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So the referendums around climate change were touted as some of the most important pieces that are happening across states. Uh, Colorado, Washington, New Mexico, all, and California, all across the country. They didn't fare so well, by and large, right? That's fair to say. So, yeah. so, and you've been in this a long time. Yeah. So, what's your analysis about what overall why these things did not pass? And we can talk about some of the specifics. Yeah, let's talk. There, I think there are kind of two groups of, uh, of ballot initiatives, amendments, referendum that we saw, kind of playing out across the country. The two that have been the most. I think widely followed are Washington's ballot initiative 1631, which would have put a small carbon tax in place. And the revenue of that would have gone to fund all kinds of different activities, including things around building a new clean energy and specifically directing some of that money to low income communities, underinvested in communities. And then the other piece that uh, many people were watching was Colorado. Um, Proposition 112, which would have put a public health setback in place from oil and drilling. It would have given about a half mile between drilling and people's homes, schools, parks, waterways, sensitive areas. Those two both failed um, in fairly big, with fairly big margins. Like 70 30 from Colorado, a half a right? Or is that like uh, the Colorado too much? was The Colorado was 40 40 60, but still a pretty okay. big spread. Yeah. Um, Washington was about 45 55, so significant numbers. Um, a, the Washington tax has been in play before a couple of times. This, it was different this time in part, and I think did did better overall and in fact was was more important for the overall national climate conversation because it was a coalition of 250 groups from across uh, the political spectrum, across the progressive spectrum I should say, from environmental justice groups to indigenous groups to environmental groups to labor groups and so it was a really interesting coalition and they went the route instead of saying it's going to be revenue neutral to saying actually we're going to collect some revenue and we're going to put it toward this new vision of a green economy. I think what went badly for both of these initiatives mm -hmm. is that the oil and gas sector outspent them by large huge margins so I think what we've seen this morning is 70 million dollars was spent on these two initiatives by the oil and gas industry that shows us that our people power is not strong enough to overcome quite that much money so, yeah. so let's examine that for a minute yeah. <clears throat> and then we can talk to me, so about some of the other referendums sure. around the country and ballot measures Washington state and Colorado are states that people think of as having huge progressive populations especially in urban areas and um, and where you think these resolutions would have passed. So one, you talked about the power of money to oppose these and the power of oil and gas money mm -hmm. to kill it. So I'm, I'm, what, I mean, what is that, what do we know about that, about that population of people that is swayed by that kind of propaganda and those that are not? And what does that say about where the environmental movement has to go, the energy movement has to go to kind of really push the idea of clean energy? Because there's, there's something amiss here. Sure, that's fair. I mean, I think we know that in those states there are some very progressive pockets and then there are broad swaths of more right. red places, or purple and red. I think what we've been learning in our work at Greenpeace is that while there are a lot of people who know that climate change is a critical issue right now, the idea of how we transition away from fossil fuels to whatever comes next, to renewable energy, is a little bit harder for people to really not conceptualize, but think about how we actually get there. So I think what's, what the fossil fuel industry is doing a good job of is playing on that fear, saying, gosh, if we have these public health setbacks, that will leave a lot of oil and gas in the ground, and that might leave jobs behind. I think the way we need to really understand this from a climate movement perspective is how we're doing a better job of articulating what we're doing instead of taking oil and gas out of the ground. That, of course, means renewable energy, moving in renewable energy forward, um, but it means other kinds of sustainability jobs. It means investing millions of dollars, billions of dollars into clean infrastructure like waterways, um, clean infrastructure like drinking water in, in, uh, in Flint. Um, it means investing in roads. So I think we need, to, we need to start articulating in a more clear way with a broader progressive alliance what kinds of investments we want in the kind of economy we want. We've been talking about that a lot on the left, a new economy. Um, we're starting to think about that now as kind of a Green New Deal. How are we actually talking about creating jobs right now by investing money in public infrastructure as a way to move people out of that zone of being really afraid of what we're going to move away from at the same yeah, time? Yeah, I've, I've had this conversation locally in, in different conversations as well here in the state of Maryland and around people are 
kind of deeply concerned about what happens to their jobs. When you look at salaries and solar salaries and some of the clean energy, they're clearly not as high as they are in oil and gas uh, or in coal. Uh, and that's a big fear factor for people, sure. whether they're in West Virginia or Colorado, wherever they are. So I'm, I'm so strategically, as we kind of, I want to go into these ballot measures we haven't talked about because I want you to go through them all for us. Sure. But, but I mean, so I'm very curious about where the conversations are going, how you begin to change that, that mindset around the green economy and build, how you create this kind of New Deal uh, wave of understanding about how we have to build and govern investment, which seems to be an anathema yeah. to a lot of people, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's some pretty clear steps that we've been talking about for a while. This just shows how important they are again, uh, I think the environment community needs to really start building in a more serious way with the labor community. It's true. Many of the uh, renewable clean energy jobs are not unionized jobs. Um, if we look at the EV sector, we see Tesla being being uh, charged with union busting, for example. That's not a really good look for the environment movement. Right, right. It's not, it's not very promising in terms of where mm -hmm. we're moving. I think what we could also look at, though, are ways that um, the environment community could be advocates for unionizing these sectors. Not to disparage people working in the fossil fuel sector, but we should also be honest about the costs to families who are dealing with the consequences of working in the destructive industries. Health consequences. Their own health consequences right. and the consequences for the places where they live, drinking water, air quality consequences, so larger public health consequences as well. I think also when we look at some of the oil and gas fracking booms and busts we've seen, while those are very high paying jobs while they exist, they also tend to go away and come back again. So it's a it's, it's not as stable as um, I think some folks would have us believe in terms of that sector. That's not to say that construction jobs, et cetera, those are designed to come to, to be on a cycle, and that's totally reasonable. But those kinds of construction jobs can be done constructing renewable en energy infrastructure as well. Um, so of course, there isn't just a one-to-one -one fossil fuel job to renewable energy job, but I think we need to think more creatively about how we as environmentalists and progressives are really championing the idea that jobs have to be good jobs, and with, I think we need to have the labor sector um, see us as credible partners in that. So that's part of that's part of the path. And then I think the other piece of the path is actually laying out exactly what this would look like. What are we? What kinds of things are we talking about building out, and where do we have to do them? And then at the same time, have the hard conversation about what we have to dial down. Um, it doesn't mean pulling the plug on Tuesday. It doesn't even necessarily mean pulling things out early, stopping, so I think we'll have to stop some oil and gas extraction early, but it really means not building new stuff out. That's very different than saying we're taking people's jobs away tomorrow. I think we have to be able to communicate that better. So let's talk a bit about the other referenda that you were sure. following around the yeah. country and, and, and what happened. Yeah, there. I think just to maybe keep going with the bad news for a, a minute <laughs> and then we'll shift to the good news. <laughs> yeah, please, <laughs> like to end on a good positive news before we get out of here. Yeah, so the other, the other kind of bad news was, I think you were alluding to, is the Arizona Proposition 127. Right. And that was uh, a re renewable energy standards initiative. It would have um, taken Arizona's uh, renewable energy portfolio standards to 50% by, I believe, by 2050. Um, that uh, 2030 apology, uh, that lost the 30 to 70 split. Um, also had massive uh, influx of money from the utilities. And so, again, we see kind of corporate money influencing the way that decision went. But there was some good news. Um, maybe I'll kind of go uh, across <laughs> the country. So Florida uh. Amendment 9 passed. It was kind of a wacky amendment. It was uh, seen as an environmental amendment that took offshore drilling um, and using vape, vaping inside and put them in the same amendment. It passed, so there, there we see a ban on offshore drilling in Florida, which people saw really as a, um, you know, both a, a review of, of Clinton slash, of, uh, ch sorry, Trump slash Zinke's attempt to really open mm -hmm. Atlantic offshore to drilling, um, and local coastal communities saying this economy, this, you know, being able to preserve this landscape is key to our economy. So it's both an economic, I think, and a environmental amendment in that sense. We saw California Proposition 6 uh, be rejected, which was going to repeal the gas tax. So California, Californians said, nope, we know that this, cal this gas tax is important. We need to keep it in place. That was amazing. People voted to have this huge tax on their gasoline, yeah. which I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was designed, as, as we're, as we've, 
kind of we've talked about in the progressive circles. It's, it was really designed in a way to bring Republicans to uh, to the, the ballot box. There was no other reason for them to come if you weren't, you know, the idea that Governor right. Newsom was probably going to win as a Democrat. He's a climate champ. He's taken the no fossil fuel money pledge. He's not right. taking money from the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. I think the, the Republicans were honestly looking for a way to get people to the polls so that they could influence the House district races. Um, and so it was exciting that that loss. I think that really says that people value the way we, that Californians use that revenue to protect and uh, uh, cover the kinds of public um, public infrastructure that they need, they use every single day. So that was a positive. Um, going back to Colorado, while we saw this public health setback lose, which was a, a real, I think, a real defeat for many people who want to see their, their health protected and really have daily impacts from that industry, we also saw Amendment 74 go down. And that amendment would have set passed. This was in This is in Colorado. Colorado as well. Right. Yeah, and this amendment would have made it functionally impossible for the state to regulate oil and gas drilling. It would have said that any time state regulation or laws uh, devalues your personal property, the state has to um, compensate you for that. So what that, what that means in, in many functional terms is if, we had, if Colorado had tried to pass rules or pass um, regulations that would have devalued property by saying you can't drill for oil or gas on it, the state would have had to pay pay basically pay corporations and that pay did not the property pass. and it did not pass right. and I think that's really important so while it says the Coloradans are we're not running to the polls to tell oil and gas to stop drilling it also says we don't want them undermining our ability to make rules to protect ourselves so I think that's I think that's a little more positive than than maybe just focusing on proposal 112 um, we also saw the Nevada question six pass which pass. was which was saying doing which was increasing the 50 percent um, renewable energy by 2030, and we saw a, a smaller a measure in Portland pass. It's called Measure 26201. It was a clean energy benefits initiative, and it puts a small it puts a fee on um, basically big box stores and raises money for in the the Portland Climate Action Plan. So that was kind of that was kind of neat to see too. So as we conclude this piece, uh, so where do you see, given the work that you do, and you've been in this work for a long time now, um, organizing around climate issues and yeah. and uh, our planet. Um, and energy. So, how does this cha how does this change you strategically, your organization strategically, Greenpeace and others, and where you take this from here? Yeah, I think what this tells me, and I think what we're we're going to be thinking about at Greenpeace for the next couple of weeks, and certainly as we move forward to the 2020 election, is how we articulate the the Green New Deal, how we articulate the vision that allows people to see the future that's not fossil fuel based as a good future, as a future that means we're healthier. We're more economically stable. Our climate's more stable, um, and we have yeah, we have a we have a stronger economy. We have good jobs. So I think that's a critical piece. I think what this really showed us is that people are coming out and voting for climate champions. They are coming out and voting against climate denial. It's hard to imagine that future right now. We need to help make that much more clear for people. We're here talking to Jenna Redmond, who is the climate and energy director for Greenpeace USA. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News. We're going to take a break and come back and have more with Jenna Redmond looking at what this new change in the House means for the future.